Your materials for today, Reader 3A and Work Text Pages 107 and 8. So where are we going today? You know, as travelers, we'd like to see where we're going. But actually, it's nowhere on Earth. We're going into space. What would it be like to fly up into space? Well, there's lots of room. I guess that's why they call it space, because there's lots of it. Now, have you ever dreamt of being an astronaut someday? You know, astronauts study very hard for their job. Many, many hours of practice flights and routine checkups occur before an actual flight takes place. And astronauts explore the stars and maybe even other planets. Do you know what the word astronaut means? Astronaut. Astro means star and not means a sailor. So an astronaut is literally a star sailor, or a person who sails through the stars. Pretty neat, huh? So what picture came to your mind? I'm kind of seeing an old-fashioned clipper ship with a captain at the helm sailing across the seas and the sky. Get that picture in your head? Well, thankfully, astronaut is our very first vocabulary word. So let's take a look at your passport. Look at this Four words, looks interesting, and we're going to be learning about several different astronauts. So let's take a look. Astronaut. It takes years of training to become an astronaut. So you could say he is a star sailor or a space traveler. Space shuttle. Astronauts travel on a space shuttle that carries them from the Earth to, to the moon and back. Hmm. A spacecraft. How about the word orbit? The oval path that the space shuttle travels around the moon is called its orbit. So you have a definition there. And the key word would be a circuit or a route around. And then rovers. That's not like your dog rover. Machines that transport astronauts or supplies along the moon's surface are called lunar or moon rovers. So the key word would be exploration vehicles. Now there's a lot of space in space. So what part of space are we going to talk about? The galaxy, the planets, moonwalks? Well, look at the title of today's selection. Views from space. Hmm. What do you think the Earth might look like from space? What would the stars look like from the moon? You know, only a few have had the privilege to see that. And then what kind of story is this? It says it's an article by Lindsay Dickinson. So do you remember how to read an article? It's a little different from how you read a story. Oh, well, we have another quick tip for getting past these obstacles that you come across when you're reading. Ah. When you're reading, it's usually a good idea to focus and pay attention, but sometimes you can actually be too focused. Picture this, you're reading and you come across this sentence, safakas are found in trees. What are safakas? Are they plants, animals, birds, a weird type of tree house? If you're reading something informational, like an article, zoom out and take a look at the big picture. Check out the section heading, Madagascar animals. That helps. Safakas are animals that live in Madagascar. What about pictures? Are there any on the page? So that's a safaka. It's cute. Kind of. Want to know more? See if there's a caption to go with the picture. Safakas are a type of lemur that leaps from tree to tree. Wow, that was a lot of info we learned about safakas. They're leaping lemurs that live in Madagascar. All we had to do was widen our focus beyond the sentence and see the big picture. 
when you pay attention to headings, pictures, and captions, you might speed along without even hitting a roadblock. So remember when you read an article, look at the photos and the captions and the other features that are not part of the body of the article, like a timeline. So as you read pages 300 and 301, find out the information that is included on the timeline. So what information is included on this timeline? It's events that took place in space exploration. Now, why do you think this display of information is called the timeline? The line has dates in chronological order that indicate a time in history. So each date has a year when the event took place. And this timeline obviously does not include every event in space exploration, but it does include the information needed for this article and look closely and see if you can find the answers, okay? What is the name of the first satellite launched into space? Did you find it? Sputnik 1. And what year did it launch? 1957. 1957? That was the year before I was born. Ooh, I hope you're not good at math. Now, how many years after John Glenn's orbit did men land on the moon? So you have to find John Glenn's orbit and men landing on the moon. Aha. So 1969, 1962. Can you do the math? That's easy. 62 from 69, seven years. How about the name of the space shuttle launched in 1981? So find 1981. Up, space shuttle. Got it? Columbia. Okay, which came first, the Hubble Space Telescope or the International Space Station? So you've got to find them, the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station. So you can see, aha, yep, the Hubble Telescope came first because 1990 comes before 1998. And last question, where did the Spirit and Opportunity rovers land? Okay, there's Spirit Opportunity rovers landed on Mars. Wow. So from Sputnik to rovers landing on Mars. You know, you can learn a lot from a timeline. And this timeline is a preview of what the article is about. It's almost like a table of contents for the important events of the story. But this isn't just about the facts of space exploration. Look at the think as you read questions. What are we thinking about today? What is a person's worldview? Hmm. What do you think the astronauts in this article say that tell you about their worldview? Hmm. So worldview, does that mean your view of the earth, I see the earth? Or is it just looking around at the world? Is it an astronaut's view from outer space? Is that his view of the world? Well, read page 302 as well as the picture caption silently to find out about our early space explorations and see if you can detect a worldview yet. Wow, wouldn't it be amazing to see the Earth from space? Now, maybe you've watched lots of documentaries on astronauts or space or science fiction. But let's look at what really happened. What is it like to be on top of the rocket, orbit the Earth, and look down at the Earth? What do you think that it looked like? Hmm, maybe this. Imagine sitting inside that little capsule on top of that huge rocket waiting for an enormous explosion of thousands of gallons of fuel that would hopefully lift tons of metal into space where no one had been before. Imagine what the first astronauts were thinking. Will it make it? Will it make it? Go, go, go. <gasps> Made it. Wow, the Earth is so small. Smaller, smaller. And then just a few years later, it was normal to suit up and float out in space over the rotating Earth to check on experiments or fix things. 
But imagine waking up on the space shuttle or space station and watching the sun peek from around the edge of the Earth. Did you notice what one astronaut said as he watched the rise of the sun over the Earth? Let's read the quotation by James Irwin at the top of page 302. That beautiful, warm, living object looked so fragile, so delicate, that if you touched it with a finger, it would crumble and fall apart. Seeing this has to change a man, has to make a man appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. Wow, look at that. So who was James Irwin? Well, he was one of the original 19 astronauts chosen by NASA in April of 1966. And he was the eighth man to walk on the moon. So how do you think his view of Earth from Earth was different from his view of Earth from space? Well, on Earth, you know, we seem almost indestructible. But from space, the earth looked so fragile and delicate so far away that what else did he say? That seeing this has to change a man, has to make a man appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. So do you think James Irwin has a Christian point of view? Yes, his words tell us what he thinks. He sees God as the creator. Now, we'll learn more about him in the next chapter, but I did learn that his trip to space changed his worldview. Now, to what does the author compare the Earth from the surface of the moon? Yes, he said it looked like a small blue marble from that far away. Look at that, Look at that tiny, tiny marble there. Imagine being... 239,000 miles from Earth that the Earth would look this small. Do you think it would be fun to take a trip into space? Well, imagine the first men to travel into space. They didn't know if they would come back. They were explorers. So who were the first people to put a man-made object into orbit? Mm -hmm. Yes. The Russians. And what year did the Russians put the first man-made satellite into space? 1957. The Russians launched the first satellite, Sputnik 1, into space in 1957. So the captions have lots of interesting information that's not in the main part of the text. A caption is uh, the text or words that tell you about the picture or illustration. Now, what year did the Russians put the first man into orbit? 1961. Imagine the courage it took to be the first. His name was Yuri Gagarin. He was the first man in space. And on April 12th, 1961, in the Soviet, uh, the Soviet mission Vostok 1, he orbited around the Earth for 108 minutes. So it took him an hour and a half, a little bit more than an hour and a half, to make one orbit around the Earth. Now, who was the first American man to be put in orbit around the Earth? Can you find the picture and caption that gives you that information? Mm -hmm. well, it's right here. So, John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth on February 20th, 1962. So that was almost a year later. And what does it mean to orbit the earth? Now, you may have an idea in your mind, but let's look it up in the glossary. Turn back to page 371. Ah, look, there is the astronaut right there, a person trained for space travel. But you don't, did you know that you don't actually have to travel in space to be an astronaut? You just have to be trained, and then you can be called an astronaut. But now, let's find the word orbit. Where will we find that? We're going to look in the O's, try to find it before I do. Ah, there it is, orbit. It's two syllables. Orbit is a noun. 
It's the path an object follows around another. And then uh, the verb is to move or travel around another object. The space shuttle will orbit the Earth many times during its flight. So, so there's two meanings of the word orbit. It depends on whether it's a, a noun or a verb. And then let's look at the forms. We have orbited, orbiting, and orbits. So they didn't go to the moon right away, did they? They were orbiting. Okay, They were working towards going to the moon, but first they have to design rockets to lift the astronauts off the Earth. They have to design suits and helmets and things to keep a man alive in the cold, airless space. They have to find out what it's like in space to make sure that they can get back. There are many, many inventions have to work before the dream of space travel could become a reality. So read page 303 silently to find out about a few other important inventions and take note of what is meant by a person's worldview. Wow, what a huge jump from the first man in space at 1961 to sending land rovers to Mars a little over 40 years later in 2003. Now, a land rover is like a robotic scientist used to study the Martian surface, rocks and soil, looking for evidence of water on Mars. Now, the two rovers landed on Mars in 2004, okay? And uh, Spirit was actually exploring until 2010, uh, and six years later. And Opportunity was active until 2018. That was 14 years on Mars. Woo. Now, all these amazing inventions that continued to work millions of miles away from Earth for years. Must be pretty smart to invent something like that. So... What is a worldview? Did you catch it? A person's worldview is the point of view from which a person sees and explains the world and everything in it. Did you know that you have a worldview? You probably just don't realize it yet. What do you believe about the world? If you're a Christian, you've put your trust in Christ and recognize that God is the creator of this world. No one knows how something is supposed to work better than its creator does. And we can learn how this world works from the creator's own words. The Bible is God's word, and God tells us how he created the world and how he sees the world that he created. So we use the Bible kind of like a pair of glasses to help us see and understand the world the way God wants us to see it. Because we can't really see unless we are looking at it through our lens of scripture, shall we say. So a biblical worldview is the Bible-based way a Christian understands the world and interacts with it. From whose point of view should a Christian seek to see the world? God's point of view or his own point of view? Well, a Christian wants to see things from God's point of view. But there are many in this world who do not believe as we do. So from whose point of view does someone who has not placed their trust in God see the world? Themselves. Let's think about that. Let's consider an ant's point of view. Hmm. How do you think an ant would view uh, maybe a house if he was twiddling up there and came to a house? Would he see it from his point of view or the builder's point of view? You know, the ant's point of view would be very limited by its size, by its experience. He would have no idea of how things work from a human's point of view. He's an ant. So the ant could not see a faucet as a useful tool, nor would it have any understanding of why the tool was invented or what good it was. What does the ant know about the house or the faucet? Only what an ant can know. Basically nothing useful compared to the builder of the house or the maker of the faucet. So can you see how man has a similar struggle when he tries to understand this world compared to the creator's understanding of the world? God created the vastness of space to show to all people his greatness and the glory through order and design. 
Now think about the astronaut. What do you think they think about the Earth, about space, about God? Do all astronauts believe the same thing? Well, read pages 304 and 5 silently to find out the worldview of each of these astronauts. Two different astronauts from two different countries. So what do we know about Kirvan Titov? He was the second Russian astronaut to fly in space and also the youngest. He was just 26 years old. So he was the first person to film the Earth from space. What year was he born? 1935, and he died in 2000. Look at that rocket. Read the caption with me. Kirman orbited the Earth 17 times in Vostok 2. Wow, that made front page news. So a Russian newspaper announced Gierman's flight to space in 1961. So did Titov have a Christian worldview? He did not believe in God, did he? Let's read aloud Titov's words that tell about his worldview. Okay. Some say God is living there in space. I was looking around very attentively, but I did not see anyone there. I did not detect either angels or gods. I don't believe in God. I believe in man, his strength, his possibilities, his reason. Did you notice how often he said, I? I was looking. I did not see. I did not detect. I don't believe. I believe. Hmm. Reminds me of the ant. He is using his own reasoning, his personal view that God does not exist. Now, if Titov was looking to see God as a physical being in space, of course he would not see them. The Bible says that no man has seen God. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what are some reasons that a Christian would want to study space? vastness of space and how it all works together is a testimony to God's greatness and his glory. God's greatness and glory are seen in all of his creation. But, you know, we tend to get used to the amazing flowers, all the different animals, the powerful weather, the variety of people. And, you know, discovering space is relatively new to us. So suddenly it seems so big and it makes us feel so small. For instance, now, I had help with the math, but if the earth were really this 17 inches tall, proportionally, the moon would be about four inches tall. So I have something, the moon here, and mm, yes, my moon is made of cheese. So how far do you think the moon would be away from the earth using this proportion? Be here? Here? Maybe up here? Actually, using the same ratio that 239,000 miles between the earth and the moon would convert to 42 feet, and that's just a few feet outside my studio. Ah, so what would the earth look like from that far away? Something like this. Ah, can you see me there in the studio by the globe? This spot is 42 feet from my globe. So if you were standing on the moon, that's about how small the Earth would look. About the size of a marble. Wow. Space has a lot of space, doesn't it? Now with all that God has created, the vastness of space is a testament the greatness of God and that he knows us and he loves each of us. But sadly, some very smart and important people chose not to believe that God created the heavens and the earth. So let's read about another astronaut on page 305. His name is Christer Fugelsung. Okay, he's a Swedish scientist. So what year was he born? Well, you can see right there that 1957 is a cue that that's the year he was born. And what year did he die? Yeah, since there's no date after the dash, that indicates that he was alive when our book was printed. So he seems like a pretty smart scientist. He trained on both NASA's spacecraft and the Soviet spacecraft. 
So what was his worldview? Sadly, he too believes there is no God. So let's read aloud um, Fugelsong's words that support this thought. Okay, right here. From about the age of 10, I've been convinced that there is no God. Hmm. So both of these astronauts agree there is no God. So how can you determine a person's worldview? By what a person says and what he does helps you to determine his point of view. Now these astronauts have had the unique opportunity to see God's creation and to give testimony to his existence and yet they rejected the idea of a creator. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So they are looking at the same facts that we look at, but they are using the wrong glasses to see the world. Sort of like that ant that looks up at the house and can't believe that something called a builder created that house. And the ant cannot know or understand the complexity of the building. So do all astronauts believe there is no God? No, not all. And we'll read about a couple of them next time. Now let's take a look at our work text pages. How do well do you read a timeline? The timeline on page 107 is very similar to the one at the beginning of our article. So I want you to use the timeline to answer the questions. So read them very carefully. Now, now for a little bit of word work. The last time we talked about prefixes, we only mentioned that they made a separate syllable. But these small syllables can also change the meaning of the base word. So look at the first set of words. Hmm. Reset and review. Each word has the prefix re. So how does the prefix re change the meaning of the base or root word? Re means again. So if you set the table and then it gets messed up, then you'd have to reset it. If you view or look at your spelling words and you miss a lot of them, you need to review the words. How about untie and unlock? Each word has the prefix un. And how does the prefix un change the meaning of the base or root word? Un means to do the opposite. So if you tie your shoe and then you have to take them off, then you must pull the laces or untie them. If you lock the door, but then you have to go back in, then you must unlock the door. And one more set, misspell and misplace. Each word has the prefix miss. And how does the prefix miss change the meaning of the base word or the root word? Miss means to do something in a wrong way. So you can spell a word correctly, or if you spell it incorrectly or wrongly, then you would misspell it. Or if you come in and place the keys on the table, you know where they are. But if you put them in the wrong place, you would misplace your keys. Now, I do that all the time. So I think you got the idea. So look at page 108. Okay, I want you to, here's the, uh, the list of uh, generalizations here, the rules there in case you need them. But circle the prefix in each of the bold words and then fill in the bubble beside the words that would give the same meaning. Now, as I was studying for this lesson, I found out something I never knew before. When I think of astronauts orbiting in space, I think of them as being like, you know, way out here orbiting in space. But I learned that when the astronauts were orbiting the Earth or even worked on the space station, they were about 250 miles above the Earth. And with this same proportion or scale, that would be like a half an inch above the surface of the globe, like a finger width that where the orbit would be. Wow, makes you feel really, really small, doesn't it? Almost like an ant. Your assignment for today is to complete work text pages 107 and 8 and read your favorite pages from Views from Space aloud.